good afternoon Nenen. hey good afternoon Yeah, I think others will join in a minute. Yes. So we uh, will Samir join? Yeah, I think Samir will join. Let me okay. Bring him in right. now. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon. Okay, Samir is here. Um, Samir, is Vani joining? Yeah, she may join. Uh, yeah, she should join. We were talking about before the meeting, but we can start. Uh, I'll bring her on the side. All right. Uh, I, I just have the initial 30 minutes. Um, I, I need to take care of something after that. Uh, but Sami should have the whole hour. So depending on that, like how, how do we want to prioritize? I started going through the um, through the cozy refactor PR. I'm still trying to make sense of the changes. I think one. So so that is one set. And I I think uh, Sami also went. Both of us went through the rc1 list there are definitely some items to be discussed there okay so on the uh cozy refactor one uh Ritesh hasn't taken a look i started looking through it i think at a at a high level i'm i still need to dig into the details uh i think Few questions that I had were, let me get the link. Um, let me actually share screen, give me a second. <clears throat> um, Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can okay. see your screen. Okay. Yeah. okay, so this one, uh, Shiva, you might be able to answer some of these. It it pulls out this interface. Previously, yeah. I think we, we just had signature envelope, like a uh, struct, can think of it like, equivalent to a abstract base class in Java, where we had some functionality, uh, kind of a routing logic where it says based on JWS or COSI call the specific implementation. And we didn't have an interface. Is there a, I'm trying to understand specific reason for having the interface. It mainly calls out like for unit testing, et cetera. Uh, yes, so uh, first of all, uh, Golang is different from uh, Java. Uh, there's no object-oriented stuff saying the yep. uh, 
no long because no long adapts uh, dark typing. Yeah. So that's a bit different. Uh, so uh, so uh, that's it. Uh, okay. And uh, we have the interface. Uh, there are uh, many uh, reasons. The first one is it's the interface. It's easier to be uh, mocked uh, for uh, a unit test. Uh, that's the first reason. The other reason is that uh, if we have a, a solid structure for the uh, envelope, that means uh, every time, if we want to uh, uh, create a new envelope type, we need to uh, modify the original package. That's the uh, that's the uh, uh, the original envelope structure. Um, that's not uh, that that's not good. Uh, instead, we should have uh, the new uh, envelope uh, uh, signature to implement this envelope interface. Sorry, can you give a little bit more detail on the second point? That means, uh, for example, if we look if we look at the code. Okay, so if we want to uh, add a new uh, signature format like cozy, that means mm -hmm. we need to uh, uh, modify all the related uh, code in the uh, uh, in the uh, envelope structure. That means uh, it's it's quite uh, the code is quite uh, coupled. So we want to decouple the code uh, from the base uh, envelope and others. But there's no JW specific thing in the base envelope, right? The, the JWS envelope and the COSI envelope are implementations are are, uh, are yes, extending they, from uh, this they base. Shared, they share the same constructor. Oh yeah, the constructor has the has the routing logic. Yes. 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 That's a major so, issue. Yeah. Okay, I mean, given that like there'll be a handful of envelopes here, this is not going to be extended to more than two or three envelopes. Uh, but I guess you are saying it'll we just implement the interface and the constructor is on the concrete type, the cozy or the JWS. So no yes. constructor from the base. Oh, okay, all right, that. Uh, Maybe later we will have like something like JWS v2 or JWS v3, v4, v5, and those versions should be uh, present at the same time. And at that, that time, then we will have problem if we have the current uh, uh, implementation. Yeah, that sounds good. I, I think I'm, I'm good with that. The, the other one is this here, right? The, the example here, the JWS code, it's pointing to code in the local local signature provider. So local signature provider actually, like if you see this, this hasn't doesn't have any tie-in with JWS. There's no references to JWS here. It's basically yeah. taking crypto key, private keys, uh, whatever the RSA or ECDSA, and just generating a raw signature. And then yeah, we have that's... classes at the layer on top of this, right? Which takes that raw signature and assembles it into an envelope. Yeah, that's the issue here. So basically uh, we are signing the stuff uh, into some raw signatures. And uh, actually we are, um, if you look at code, uh, although we are using the Go JWT um, uh, library, right? Yep. However, we are actually uh, writing the Go JWT uh, implementation by ourselves. That is that is right because we have we are because the signature is actually JWS format finally. Yes, but uh, but uh, uh, yes, right. But we are constructing the signing string by ourselves and sign the signing string by ourselves and, uh, and then do encoding. That means. We are actually doing everything ourselves. We are not using the Go JWT library. That, that means uh, we are actually creating a new library. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. I think the one of yes, the reasons that, that is means because even if uh, we are using an approved Go JWT library by the crypto board, 
and we are not using that. So um, I don't think it's a secure solution uh, because we need to do a lot of tests uh, for the JWT part. So the, uh, the code change made by uh, us is that uh, we refactor the code so that uh, we pass the original private key to the uh, library and let library to everything, including generating the uh, signing string, uh, do the signing, and also do the verification. And uh, uh, our code that's in the notation call go part only does the encoding and decoding, uh, which does not touch the uh, crypto part. So one of the reasons it's that way is because we implemented some common logic between the plugin signer and the local yeah. signer. The local on disk signer is actually implemented as a plugin signer. Right, I, I don't know if there's a way to invert that where uh, we did uh, we did that. So if you look at the new code in the uh, PR twenty six, uh, we have a way to bypass it and let the library do everything. So even with the plugin implementation, it will use the underlying either JWT or Cozy library and have that call the plugin as a signer, I guess, crypto signer. Yes. yes. So uh, uh, can uh, can you go to the uh, PR26 so you can have a look at the code? Uh, okay, give me a sec. File changes, and there's a, a JWS implementation. Uh, go to jwt.go maybe, um, or you can start with the jws.go, whatever. Um, um, or maybe go to the envelope.go and you can have the entry point. So there's, I think there's a method called sign. Um, this one? Yes, this one. So as you can see here, uh, this is generate everything and uh, does the sign at line uh, 70. And uh, if you Go to the implementation of line 70. 70, yes. Uh, the sign. Uh, and go to implementation of the sign function. Uh, it's not highlighting that. Uh, maybe scroll down <laughs> a bit. Oops. Let me. Sign, sign. Here. Oh. oh, yeah. So, as you can see, uh, uh, here's a token, and uh, we directly call sign stream method and pass the uh, private key to it. And that private key can be abstraction over plugin? Uh, the, the plugin and the local key is, is wrapped in the method. So uh, it's better to okay. uh, look Got at the, the method. So- Okay, um, no, no, no. I, I get the overall idea. I think that makes sense. It's definitely from kind of inverting this looks better and it's using the JWT library. But then there is a JWT, JWT to, to JWS conversion somewhere, right? Yeah, but this conversion is just for uh, just encoding. It does not touch crypto, so it's fine. Cool, that sounds good. I think, uh, okay. I guess that didn't get called out here clearly. I uh, I understand some of the concerns now that that isn't, isn't called out as explicitly in this description. Um, so it's basically, we are able to use whichever libraries inbuilt remote provider or remote signing. And that remote signing can either use a local key or a remote signing using plugin. Yeah. Um, sounds good. I think this gives me the background to look into this further. Um, again, I'm, 
I'm working on this. Pratish is also going to prioritize this, so you, you'll get comments. Uh, all right, we can move on to the next topic. We have, uh, at least from my side, another 15 minutes before I have to leave. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> cool, thanks, Shiva. Um, yeah, I appreciate the work. Uh, I think that that is some good refactoring. I'll, I'll go and get into the details there. Uh, Minin, and one question, uh, will you and uh, Pritesh uh, be able to get the review done by this week? Yes, we are, we are still, uh, like I said, we, we, we are still kind of committed on that. We uh, I have allocated some time to get the review done and unlock this. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, do we want to go through the the RC one? Um, actually, let me pull up the agenda items. Yeah, maybe we can firstly address the agenda item, the number number four. Next steps for the Alpha four and the Alpha three patch. Uh, I see one issue left for this uh, alpha 4 or alpha 3 patch release is about the relax of self-signed certificates. So the self-signed certificates, uh, I think we are, uh, I'll have to sync back with Pratesh. He was supposed to, Samir, do you have an update on that? I didn't yeah. track that. Yeah, yeah. So Pratish was out of the office for all of last week. Uh, I have touched base with him uh, and asked him to look at that uh, uh, spike update, and also if he can do the implementation update. I have not. Uh, I don't have an ET on that one, but it is on Pratish's radar now to update the spec and and then suggest the implementation change or do the implementation change. The overall, this is just for support for self-signed certificates, right? Yes, that's the idea. Okay. So there is a story we created uh, or a um, issue we created, which is in the notary project. Uh, let me share the link. You can have a look at this as well, uh, Milanth, and tell me if I got everything right in it. I think I did, but it's always good to get very validation. Uh, I'm putting it in the chat right now. And I this want... This is also right, Samit. This is where we are relaxing the uh, recommendation instead of two. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Please, yeah. The, yep, that is all right. Be, right. Yeah. Yep. So I don't have an ET on that uh, to answer the question, yeah, but I think uh, we will uh, get an update in a day or two from Prithviraj as to when he can uh, change the spec and then um, do an implementation change as well. Okay, great. I think based uh, on I, like yeah. based on yeah. how much bandwidth we have we have between me and Pratesh, I think the spec update is pretty small. We can get it by Thursday or Friday. Probably can get it approved also. It's it's not gonna be a big change. I think implementation will follow in the next next week. I think we can close this by next week. Okay, great. Yeah, once uh, once there is a PR. Uh, we can, from our side, we, we can speed up the review for it. Cool. Okay, and just my curiosity for the code change, uh, Milan, and I'm showing my ignorance here. I don't know if the code changes have needs to happen in a uh, notation go or notation core go. The reason I'm asking is I'm not sure if Pratish is familiar with that code or not. So we assigned it to him without asking his permission. No, I think, it, I mean, either way, it should be fine. He, he would be able to update either any of those repositories. Okay. Uh, I think some of our certificate logic is in notation core. Though. This, this is probably in the same place. Okay. So, so Melin, the, does that mean that we are targeting this change for Alpha 4 or Alpha 3 patch, whatever we call it? I think, uh, again, I was on vacation. I think this was probably the issue that Steve opened saying signing was failing with self-signed certificates. Is that right, Steve? I think this was separate compared to the stability of the Alpha 3 itself. No, Steve, I think 
No, I think Vani, they are related. I think what Steve explained. Oh, they are? Is, is they are related, Steve? I think, I think, but let's Steve it's answer. Them. It, so this was one of the things that um, the usability was harder because we weren't spraying self-signed certs, but there was some other pieces that um, Feynman and uh, Yi were working to work, were working through. Including okay, well, things like the Azure key vault okay. provider was out of sync, right? There's just, there's a couple of changes. Okay. So this basically is, Alpha 3 is implemented as per the spec. I wouldn't call it a bug or a, like, yeah, it's, it's basically what, what we had in the spec, but I think we are, we debated about supporting self-signed certificates. And, yeah, agreed. Yeah. And it's fine. Like this is exactly why we want to do multiple releases so we can get a feel for it and see if we really like what we thought was the good idea. And this is exactly the right cool. questions. Um, I think the other one I quickly wanted to cover was the sign, define signing command experience. Sorry, actually we can cover that later when we talk about RC1. Uh, the other related to the next notation release was the ORAS update for the reference API compatibility with ECR. Did that release happen? I think I checked. Oh, this is not OCI release. specific. It's basically the, the, just in general, there was an ECR bug. This has nothing to do with the OCI versus ORAS artifacts. You're saying the ECR. Right, right. Right. This is what the one where Nima worked uh, on fixing the issue. I saw yeah, the thread, so I'll let them speak. Yeah. I think we have the new libraries, but we have to build uh, notation and notation go, right? Yeah, I see a note from last week's September 1st meeting, or as release date is 9.5. V2 RC3. Did that? Did that no, happen? No, Melinda. I think uh, there was a discussion yesterday between Shiva, me, and Yi uh, that it's not available. It will get available by end of business tomorrow, right? Okay. Shive, Yi, you want to comment on that? No, that, that sounds good. So once, uh, yeah, just uh, Shiva, if you can notify on notation channel or like whichever communication channel that the release is available, then we can take the next steps to update notation. So that is one. We talked about self-signed certificates. What else needs to go in the next release? That's it. I think those are the two big items I see for the uh, next batch release or, or, or Alpha 4. And the okay. plugin verification is also part of that, right? That's, uh, yeah, that's already uh, approved already, and launched. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, you're right. That feature is also part of it. Yes, uh, I think once the ORAS go, we, we have a new release. We will inform you in the in the channel, so that uh, you you can start to update the dependencies for for the rotation libraries. Cool. Yeah, I think um, that is yeah. All right, I I have another five minutes. Do do we we quickly want to go through the RC one user story? Yeah. Um, yeah, Melinda, yeah, since the last time you saw the user stories, uh, where we had uh, user stories, we uh, have brought in Cozy as a user story for RC1. That's the only change you may have seen from last time. If you somebody can share the screen and share the agenda and do that, yeah, we can talk to it. Uh, let me share it. And actually, I also prepared uh, a plan for the RC1 release. Let me share my screen. Let me find the page. Okay, this one. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, yeah I, is, uh, I did not. Um, yeah, this you had the the HackMD doc too. Uh, yes. Let's this see. one. Ah, okay. So, yeah, basically, I I go on. Sorry, the, basically, the 
uh, one, two, three, four, five other user stories in the uh, notation planning board. Um, and this one, the last one, re enable timestamping, is, is an issue under the other one scope. Uh, but this uh, uh, this is uh, not a small effort, so so I want to highlight it. And we have a proposal to split this issue to two phase. And this one, trust policy, uh, yeah, the trust policy at the store. This is CLI. Previously, this one is not in as one scope, uh, but we found that without CLI to manage the store and the policy, it's very hard for the user to use policy and the store. So yeah. that we propose to include this for as one. Uh, otherwise, we will have this uh, user experience degraded. I think that's a, that's a that's a fair feedback. I just want to kind of color that by saying that even if you have CLI support, users need to be aware of all the different concepts, right? So when so for example, trust. Trust store is more straightforward. You just say, in this particular trust store, add remove certificates. Trust policy, you need to be aware of all the trust policy switches. So whether you are doing the JSON, I would say it's it's like using CLI commands, right? Like Azure or AWS. You can either call the API using SDK, or you can use the CLI, or AWS CLI, or Azure CLI. You still need to be aware of all the parameters and what those mean. I think that that's what I want this group to be aware. CLI support for trust policy is not gonna dramatically simplify the experience. It's gonna be a CLI based experience, but you still need to be aware of the concepts that went into the trust policy and what they mean. Hmm. Yeah, Does that make I, sense? I think I mean, like if you want, we can we can go through the trust policy JSON. Like we we can have dedicate maybe half an hour, kind of going and refreshing our memory through that, because I, I want everybody to understand this this particular piece. Because whatever CLI commands we come up with, and the reason why we wanted to push this outside of RC one was it's going to be a bit of substantial effort just coming up with the good CLI experience, because all of those concepts will get surfaced in the CLI experience. Like you will say, uh, add a trust policy with scope, provide the scope, what is the trust store, what is the verification level, and that's at like a high level. And then you have other options within it, like overrides, et cetera. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think for that part, we needed to have some some guidance for, for the user, uh, right? Yep, and it can like to have totally. A, have a like, user to under, understand the, uh, the concept because if we also need to spend the time to digest those uh, pro properties, I don't think it is easy for the user to do it, right? So- No, so it's we not, I, I guess guidance, what I mean, uh, what I mean by yeah. that is like, if, if if you have worked with like IAM based policies or any policy language, right? You need to be familiar with the policy language and its concepts, whichever way you do it. The most I see probably one way to further simplify is this, like the CLI experience can be a, like a wizard or a walkthrough, right? You have questions and answers and options and all of that. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm highlighting is definitely a good thing to address it's going to be time consuming to come up with the initial spec and the implementation. So we should take that into consideration for, do we include this in RC1 or do we do it as part of RC2? I will second what Merit is saying. Uh, and um, I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, sorry, Samir, I'll, I'll jump on to a few of the other ones before I have to leave. The, the other feedback was the sign and verify experience. Uh, those are the CLI command experience. So the the link that we currently have that the sign ex for the sign experience that's just an issue I opened. That was some of the high level feedback. the The real work here is 
like some of the work that Steve started where he was baselining the CLI experience, we need to go and refine the CLI experience for sign. So, so like estimate wise, I wouldn't call it small effort. And then the verify one, I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably mix it with the trust or trust policy. Trust or trust policy set of commands, you run it once, you set up your policies, and then the verify is a separate command that you could run multiple times, right? It uses the same set of trust or trust policy that you previously configured. So we should allocate some dedicated time for both sign and verify. The writing the experience the CLI experience probably will take about a week to get in, get through the review, et cetera. The implementation is straightforward. I think minimum each of these will take about a week for the spec and probably a week for the implementation, just covering the review cycles. So this line is talking about, Milan, the defining the trust policy and trust store or the usage of it when you are verifying it? What What is this line? It's, it's just the notation verify command. What, what is hmm. the command? Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever we call about CLI experience, it means what are the command line parameters? What are required parameters? What are optional? What are default? If documentation for that, like if you say notation verify minus minus help, whatever mm -hmm. that would give, right? That is what we want in the CLI experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think other than this, I think the only other feedback I had was the diagnostics logging. This is something that we totally sidelined during the current alpha three implementation. We, we need to implement diagnostics uh, especially RC1 uh, kind of customers, adopters using this, there'll be a lot of troubleshooting things, scenarios not working, bugs. Uh, we need the diagnostics logging in at least some form. So I would, I would strongly recommend including diagnostics logging in the RC1 feature set. Uh, we could even prioritize it over some of the other ones if required, but I think that's definitely needed. Uh, otherwise, it's it's difficult to support. Like you'd get a bunch of bug reports as if you are not able to uh, replicate or get enough context. It'll we'll spend a lot of time on support. So, I, no, I, I completely agree with you on diagnostics logging. I mean, any way we can help customers support themselves before they have to call us is always a huge thing. My only question would be RC one and maybe an RC two is the need to get something out even without that, just to get something in customers' hands. So I just, it, all things being equal from time and features, I struggle with how much that would delay us. So that that's my only feedback is not, should we ship an, a 1.0 without it, but does it need to be an RC1 versus an RC1? I, I think, so. yep, I, I, I think it should be because I assume RC1, RC2, our pre GA will have more bugs, et cetera, issues, edge cases that we would smoothen out as we get feedback, right? And if you want that cycle to be smoother and us to respond effectively, not spend too much time troubleshooting and not spend too much time trying to reproduce issues, that's where the diagnostics logging will help. And it's, I don't think it's uh, maybe a week of effort is what it will give, but it will save time for all of the developers who will be supporting this. I don't disagree. I think it's just a matter of what is the timing and do we have resources to do that? Does it slip, how much does, does it slip or is just, can we get some more resources to help? Right? Like Shiwei's team has been able to, to bring in a number of people online. Um, took us a little bit for him to ramp them up. But now, yeah, the, yeah. So specifically, the class of issues is if you are not able to reproduce, you won't be able to help. And then there's like, there's like you have to then say, customer, can you share me your artifact? Can you share me your signature and things like that? Which I, I don't uh, just, just can we clone another resource so we don't lose a week? Sorry. I'm just saying if there's a way that we can clone another resource, add somebody, <laughs> we don't lose more time 
or something because I agree with the pay me now, pay me later. I'm just, I, I am still focused on the timeline. Sure. Um, yeah, we can discuss about this. So the, the, this was my high, high level feedback. I, I, I got to drop, I think we can use Thursday's project planning time further to discuss this. Were there any questions for me? Samir, D. How are we doing on uh, PRs in general? I guess is the only question that maybe that's what you was going to go with. Uh, we we had a meeting about that yesterday. Uh, some of us were out last week, and then I, I think the main set of PRs right now are around Cozy, and we are focusing on that. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Thank I got to leave. Thank you, Nanda. Thank you, Mini. Uh, thank you, Mini. Sorry, so we wrapping up, or was that just Samir uh, or Malin dropping? No, that was just Malin dropping. Yeah, it was just Malin dropping. So, Malin uh, gave us feedback on the uh, RC1 plan. I think that's some very good feedback. I will echo all the sentiments he has there. Um, what do we do with this data now? I have some suggestions. Uh, my first suggestion will be, uh, let's scope out the trust policy and trust store work separately. Uh, and I think Melinda is cautioning us the right way that the trust policy implementation which is different options to override and uh, could be a lot of effort. So my suggestion, break it, break it into two parts, notation, trust store CLI implementation and notation trust policy CLI implementation. Um, and I'm not saying we should commit both of them to RC1. I'm saying let's at least divide them up. Uh, uh, for, for the user story, uh, divided into two, uh, I'm fine with it. Yep. But, but the problem is that if we don't have a, a CLI experience, how, how can the user use RC1? Basically, Felix, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very cumbersome. User needed to manually copy, search, and manually edit the JSON file. And there are many properties. How, how can the user use RC1? Yeah, so my thought there is you'll have examples of uh, valid policies as an example, and users follow the examples of policy to construct their own policy. Uh, and again, this is in spirit of what Steve said to get something out there sooner. Uh, but what if we, we can have a basic framework, uh, I mean, the basic CLI for, for the for the policy and the store, and we can refine it in RC2, maybe RC3 later, but in RC1, we could introduce a very basic command line for it. And, and for that, we, we can uh, provide a proposal for it and uh, asking for a review uh, uh, from this week. Steve yeah, I was just going to add another thought because I, I, yes, I think we need to have a CLI. We've talked about this, whether it's an RC1 or RC2 or whatever, but the other place that we can do this as an alternative to cut out of the direct code changes, because I, I agree with you conceptually on, you know, samples and so forth. The question is, where are those samples? We've all collectively failed in, in keeping up the notaryproject.dev website as a way to communicate what we're doing and how customers can use it. Um, I know we'll have great Azure integrations and sorry, cloud integrations within Azure and AWS. That's awesome. But as an open, as a stewards of an open source project, we need to be able to communicate what that's done. That's not necessarily cloud specific. So if it's as simple and I haven't had my hands on enough to know what the actual simplicity is when I see it, it scares me, but you know, if we collectively or will, and I say collectively, I mean AWS people and Azure people and whoever else we can get are willing to help write docs at the notaryproject.dev site on how you get started and here's some sample templates that, and, and it could be sample templates that work in AWS or work in Azure, right? But I think we need to explain how to do that cloud agnostic 
first in that website and then show how they can also be done in our various clouds. Um, I think that can mitigate the balance between here's a JSON file, click on the portal in AWS and it just gives it to you automatically or whatever is in Azure or whatever, versus here's how you use it. Here's some copy paste template code. If it is not embedded as part of the CLI, right, Steve? Yeah, because I look, I I have been working on tools for years. It's very hard to do you know, to tool uh, CLI kind of experiences while the runtime is still evolving. It helps, and but to the same token, building a CLI helps realize the gaps in the runtime. So I think they need to coexist. Right. But at the very least, having a set of docs that explains what can be done is pretty important. Yeah, so, yeah, I think uh, what you're saying is once we have alpha four, uh, we all can practice a couple of scenarios with the notation baseline and then conclude uh, on the CLI experience, whether this will a must have for RC1 or, or a nice to have for RC1. I think we just, I don't have enough data for me to say it's a very poor experience with the way I'm conceptualizing it. Um, so let's not commit to include trust policy and uh, trust store CLI and RC1. Let's break it up into two parts, get independent scope estimates for it. Uh, I think you, whoever you had scope it out, have them uh, probably reach out to Milind on the side about his concerns as to why he thinks it could be a lot of work, a lot of concepts to expose in CLI, which in itself will be a lot of work that will give us better scope for trust policy. Trust store I can see could be easy. Trust policy I think could be more work. Mm. Uh, Sammy, uh, we, we do split this the user story into two. Yeah, at least do yeah. that. Yeah, I, I agree. Trust trust store and trust policy are different, right? I mean, I think the, the store you, you have to have because the yeah, thing doesn't work with that basic, you know, Certificates mm -hmm. being stored. So, if that yeah. if that isn't if that isn't good, then it, it's a problem. Whereas the policy, you could, like for instance, have safe defaults or other other ways to, you know, work around that. But at the end of the day, people are going to have to add, modify, do different things with certificates in the in the store. And I think uh, the diagnostic part of it, and again, not somebody who has actively debugged field issues in 15 years. So <laughs> I will give it to uh, Shive and Milan and the actual implementers uh, to help us understand the priority of it. I think it's a high priority. We will get deluged with issues to debug on day one itself. Is, is, isn't uh, defining the policy is one part of it and verification of it is another part of it? Verification is already implemented uh, uh, because the verification, imagine you have a trust policy written already in a JSON file. Uh, following the trust policy and verifying is, is already implemented. Okay. Uh, but the uh, verify the CLI using trust uh, policy and trust store, that part is not ready. But yeah, that part is connected to the user experience on, on, the, on how to manage your trust policy and the trust store. Yeah, that's why I think for the second row that you had, uh, I think for the second row you had, uh, we have a different understanding of what the second row means. For me, the second row is uh, make sure the notation verify command has the right uh, sub options in it. And the notation verify command has the right help string or the error output in it. Uh, including the configuration of trust policy and trust store as part of notation verify, I believe is not the way I'm thinking about it or Melinda is thinking about it. Because you can figure uh, one and you verify multiple times. So I think let's the notification that second row, third column cost estimation is a wrong assignment. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Samir, the, the second one, this only means that the cost is covered by by this CLI support 
for policy and store, we we uh, estimate it together. Uh, but uh, uh, for this uh, item, this verify is uh, is uh, the new verify CLI to use policy and the trust store. It's a it's a different. Just the cost we combine it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe I have to correct, correct something here, right? So I understand. However, you get to your trust policy doesn't matter whether you use CLI to create the trust policy or hand edit it. You get to a trust policy which is a big JSON file. We, but I believe we already have code which can parse that JSON file today and verify signatures. I believe that already uh, exists. Yeah, that that what that part is in the library. So so let's say if we don't have this CLI for policy and the store, we we have the verify CLI to support using trust policy and the, and the trust store. So uh so that effort is not uh, not that big because the library already supported it. But the main issue is the how user okay. can configure policy and the store. That is the, the main issue. So we combine the cost uh, into this one. Yeah, I see what you've done, but I will suggest we, we don't combine the cost. We can talk about the benefit of doing it together, but we may not do it together is where I'm coming. So maybe just treat the notation verify command with all its different sub options. And uh, how do we uh, invoke the notation verify? Let's keep it separate from a costing perspective. That will be another suggestion I have. Uh, yeah, the, I think that one uh, we, we, we can accept it. We can separate it. There's no problem for it. OK. And and I, and did we all pick up on what Milan was saying? I don't know he had to leave early, but he said if, when he's thinking of sign and verify in the plugin, he's thinking of the exact CLA command and the sub options we will use, along with making sure those sub options work as we expect them to work, and any error handling that we need to happen as well. That's the sign and verify command experiences he's thinking about and I'm thinking about. Okay, enough said on that one, but what about his request about the diagnostic bringing in RC1? Any thoughts on that? What have we heard yeah. from uh, anybody else has any thoughts on that? Shiva, your thoughts on bringing in diagnostic capability in RC1 itself? Uh, so if you want to build in that, that means we first need to merge the cozy part first, and then we need we might need to refactor the notion Go library to uh, accept the uh, diagnostic logs. Because uh, to uh, have those logs, we need some loggers, and uh, I don't think we we have we ha we need to no we we should not embed the logger into the library. Because uh, um, um, I mean, different applications will use different loggers. Some will use loggers, some will use Dapper, and others maybe use Apex or other, uh, uh, I mean, log libraries. So that means our uh, notation Go library should be decoupled with the log library. And we need time to investigate whether uh, it is possible or not um yes um so basically yes we need like one week to investigate and uh, then we need to decide whether to refactor, refactor or not and decide which logger should we use in the notation cli and then we should have another week one or two to do refactoring and uh, uh injecting the logs so if we are not doing refactoring, then we save time. Um, we can do it quickly. But if we uh, want to do refactoring, uh, then uh, it's, it takes time. I got you. Maybe I was not my bad. Go ahead, Lan. Actually, the other day we were talking about verbose logging, isn't it? That is also one type of diagnostic logging, isn't it? Yes, that's what I was referring to. Not to log to a cloud somewhere, but to just have more verbose logging. I just uh shared the um shared uh, option to support yeah is that is that not true shivan uh pardon 
uh, is it not, are we not talking about verbose diagnostic logging or are we talking a different type of diagnostic logging here? Oh, uh, we're talking about the debug logging. Debug logging. Yeah. Yeah, actually, so, I'm sharing the screen, the issue, Samia. Okay. Yeah, so my thinking, again, not being an implementer for a long time, uh, I was thinking that this debug output will go on to the local uh, standard out, and we can ask people to pipe it to something, and we can debug it from there. I was not thinking of logging it inside a service in the cloud. No, it's, uh, we're, we're not talking about that. Uh, okay. Actually, it depends on... Uh, which level of logging would you want? So if we want, if we just want to do verbose logging uh, at a very high level, then we can do it quickly uh, within one week. Uh, but if we want some uh, detailed logs, then we need to integrate that with the uh, the 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 notation Go library, and then that's oh uh, that may cause some other issues. But uh, first of all, we need to lock it into the code. See how much uh logs can we get from actually from the notation ci okay so it goes back to understand the existing user experience first then figure out what else needs to be added yeah okay okay uh so that means the the cost is uh varies uh, it varies from one week to three weeks so yeah. Yeah. yeah and i'm thinking about the least amount of work to give some basic logging um uh, using the debug option we just you just mentioned Okay, um, and the other thing Ani and I were thinking too about is because you were asking me, right, what's a good release content for RC1? What about Steve for um, the OCI reference spec? I believe it, uh, there's a draft out there now and people are actively com commenting on it. I think if we release notation without support for uh, notation RC1, without support for uh, the new OCI spec, people will, uh, surprised because we have been advocating for it for so long as notation to have OCI adopt us back. What do you think about? I think this is another place we can get ourselves caught up and, and slow us down. Like both our registries, as far as I can tell, like I know what ACR does publicly and MAR does publicly. I don't, since uh, ECR isn't public and I don't know what where Michael's at, but the spec that's under OCI has not been released yet. There are still some proposed changes and discussions that are happening. So yes, I think the I think we talked about this last week. Because we're based on ORAS, it's really work we would do in ORAS Go to support the new manifest. That manifest has not been released yet. It's not finalized. So I don't want to get too far wrapped up around that and slow us, slow our release down while that's still stabilizing. Understood. Uh, but my, so I, I have a follow up question on that for Shiva. Shiva, I noticed that you created an item 271. There's a link to it here. Uh, Yi, if you can share the link. Yeah. Uh, you tentatively put it for the RC4 uh, of, of ORAS. Uh, do you have a rough scoping estimate that you think that's why you're thinking it can come? It can come or like what is the, like, is this date real? Like uh, we are saying it could be an RC4 of ORAS. An RC4 for ORAS when I saw the date was towards end of or middle of September. If it's that. Uh, no. yeah, that's not possible for the middle of September. Okay. Okay. Is there a separate scope estimate on this? Like, uh, can you add a scope estimate as to how much work is this? And then we can figure out the date from that. Like, what is the scope estimate once? the spec is finalized? Is it three weeks, six weeks? Mm. I think for that part, we, we are still working on that. We are uh, now analyzing the impact uh, of introducing this OCI manifest and also the fallback workflow. So once that is, uh, once that analysis is done, we, we can have a very, very good uh estimation cost estimation for it got it so maybe that's the data steve i would like to look for uh if possible uh you, you and shiva if it's possible to do it by say next a week or two to get a good scope estimate on it that way uh, steve and niaz and others can make a better decision 
hey, this is this much scope, there's no way we can fit it in, let's plan for RC2. But until we have good scope, I think it's hard to make the call. Yeah, I think once we, we are done, we, we, we can we can share to you. Okay, okay, sounds good. Yeah, uh, I would just not block on, on that. Um, I, let me see if I can get a conversation going with Michael Brown um, and see what we want to do about closing out the loose ends. For instance, subject versus refers is one. There's another question around, which is not a bigger issue for us, but it's the, um, should the, subject manifest exists before you push it. So there is a couple of details. Let me just get that conversation going and see if we can solve that by next week. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, okay, so E, I think based back on your agenda item about reviewing this, we came up with some ideas to what to include, what to exclude. Uh, let's talk on Thursday again uh, after you split the stories and, uh, and create the separate cost estimate uh, and I will give it some more thought on uh, the diagnostic and check with Milan what is the level of diagnostic he thinks is minimum for RC1. Uh, let's see. Any other thing, Vani, you wanted to cover? Uh, about the release, right, uh, that we were talking about. Uh, about the release uh, management itself. Oh, yeah. So that's our agenda. Yes, that's a good idea, Steve. I think Steve, you had asked us to uh, think about not having releases go out, which don't meet basic test cases. So uh, Mani and I were just, uh, we're new to open source, but she and I were just following on our experience with other code releases saying, can we have a formal approval process that two maintainers uh, like you or Niaz or you or Justin have to give an approval saying, yep, we think this release is good to go and only then we cut a release, otherwise we don't cut a release. It's a manual procedural cadence. <laughs> it's not automated yet. So how do we make sure that we are all aligned for a more stable uh, release? Yep, I mean, I think that it's just the balance of spending time on it, automating it and getting it out. So, I mean, this is something David was helping out. So I don't know, David, you wanna add? Yeah. Yeah, David, like for example, what happened with the alpha three where we found some uh, bugs like that, that Steve yeah. later, we don't want that to happen again. So what check and balances we can add in the system without causing friction? So yeah, that I mean, that's where, I mean, that's where the end end test framework, I think is really important, um, you know, because I mean, we could, Otherwise, every single change you're having to manually test the whole various workflows, right? And it doesn't scale. So um, I know that we have an, uh, an established end to end framework uh, on the ORAS side. I think that was an issue a few weeks back. Um, I think that Bindon had, um, but I, I think we need to establish that for, for notation. And with the, with the the commands that we want to ensure work, and and that's mm -hmm. I think going to be the biggest thing. Yeah, uh, reply to David. I think the E two E framework could be uh, partly reused from ORAS and uh, from ORAS to notation, uh, but uh, the prerequisite is that we need to finalize the uh, UX design and. Uh, uh, the functional uh, implementation first, and then we can have all of those EP tests and uh, automation tests in notation for RC1. Well, this is in our plan. Yeah. Autom automation, uh, Fain. Uh, and uh, David, is are you talking about the automation of end-to-end -end test scenarios across? Yeah, so I mean, effectively, you know, we have the dev build now running, right? So the complement to that would be, right, adding once the dev build cuts whatever, you know, the, the one of the week, then you run, you know, effectively notation, you know, 
sign blah and and then verify that it has the actual result against you know what your expected test result is right so you yeah. go through a number of test cases that you expect to be working um and then you don't you know let's say you don't merge to main until so those things are are done or you don't at least cut a release right mm -hmm. um, until those things are fixed Right. I, I, I really would want to, you know, encourage velocity of merging to main, um, but just not cutting releases until we have the tests done. Right. And so the the testing part is the thing that's been a challenge uh, so far. Right. I mean, we can you could pass unit tests and that's good. We, we're adding those things. Right. We've, we've got a, a lot of unit tests around the different repos, but. Right. You, still don't, you still don't know if the actual functionality that the end user is going to see is going to work or not, which is yes. where the test and then test come in. And the unit test case is only at the API level, not at the feature level, isn't it? Right, right. I mean, I know, I mean, I mean, I've been very thankful to Yi and Finman who have been finding these bugs, uh, but it's, yeah. that's a lot, that's a lot of work, right? Yeah, that's definitely. And they're every single time going through just, and that's just only covering part of our kind of key workflow uh, just to just to try and make sure it works right and then we keep finding problems um, along the way and and and, and that's kind of where we're starting to do right with the dev build is is the hope is that well we can catch these issues earlier if we automate you know we're already automating the, the release of the notation cli if we pair that with the end-to-end -end test then hopefully we can start to find these problems um you know at every week uh with with the the end goal of hopefully accelerating the amount of releases that we have um right. the, only, the only way that's going to happen is is if we automate these things and and agree upon right what's the core set of functionality that we we want to you know make sure is working right and david uh, when we say the unit test at the api level do we also test the failed scenarios and also variations of the uh, payload of the API, the contract itself. Yeah, so so I think, I mean, this is, and we talked about this quite a, a number of months back, um, but mm -hmm. I think that the V1 would be to have, you know, think of some good test case for the notation CLI itself that's going to utilize the APIs under the hood. Um, it's the happy because, part because, because yeah i mean i think i think long longer term i know we have a backlog item of, of uh automating the actual api uh test cases as well like from an end-to-end -end test experience but mm -hmm. um it you know again uh, we do have some people using the the apis directly but um i think that we're going to get the most bang for our buck so to speak from from a effort if we automate the notation CLI, which then of course uses the underlying APIs under the yeah, hood. exactly, yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of our our V one target is is to to do the notation CLI, and then um, you know down the road, then perhaps yeah, we could add more automation to the to the libraries. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, yeah. Sorry, David. I think for the testing, we, we needed to firstly, uh, the end to end testing, we need to firstly make sure the CLI, this assigned experience and the verify experience is, is finalized. Otherwise, it's, it's very hard. Yeah, yeah. it's hard yeah. to introduce yeah. that. But yeah. we can introduce the framework maybe firstly. Then yeah. later we have this uh, uh, finalized, we can introduce the end to end cases step by step. Yeah, yeah. We can we can probably uh, I like that uh, approach. We can par probably start building it and partially verifying the response itself, but the key feature will not be of course concluded one before the verify is done. Yeah, I mean I don't I, I think that the framework we have uh, that is on the ORAS side I think that 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 should be fine. I don't think we just go to PowerShell and do something else. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. but I, I would say though, this this is a good way, in my opinion, to also prove out uh, what you want to have working for RC1 and NGA, right? Because you use the end-to-end -end test stories as as a 
as a way to say, okay, this is this is what we want to work. This is the flow we want you know users to have a good experience with, and we're ensuring that by testing it every every single time we do a release, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, there's going to be, of course, there's going to always be different, you know, like user test case flows and other things, but we're, we're at, you know, zero end to end testing right now. Um, other than, I mean, if you, at least for automated, right. Um, so, so it, it, it really helps to solidify uh, scope as well. Right. So, you know, that's, and that's part of what I had in a separate issue uh, around, you know, which commands, because there's right now, there's a lot of notation subcommands that we're really not touching at all, like, like mm -hmm. cache and some other ones that I, I, I think we've all agreed are less important. Um, but to an end user right now, I, I would say they, they think it's all the same, you know, and, and I, I think that if we really want to accelerate getting to GA, then, and, and we'll even RC1, RC2, 1.0, we're gonna need to make sure that we appropriately scope what is um, the notation, you know, subcommands and, and flows that we want to make sure are rock solid. Because Maybe we need to have the Bible of all the commands, including the subcommands. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying we need to rip out everything um, that is not there, but I do think right, that right. if we, if we at least kind of agree that, let's say, I, I'm just, let's just say, we know, of course, sign verify is, is, you know, something we want, um, then we just take other ones that, and put a preview label or whatever else on them. And if, if it's, if it's so broken or so like unusable, then we can make a call at some point and say, well, it doesn't even make sense to have preview on it, but at least that way, like, you know, if we try and go GA with all the sub commands we have now, I mean, we're going to, it's going to be a really long time. Right. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. And, and so we, we need to, I, I think we really need to hone in on the scope of okay. the most important and make sure that that, that end user experience is really is super solid and tested and automated and, and whatnot. Right. Maybe a phased approach, right, David? That's where you're going. Yeah. 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 Uh, actually, I'm starting to prepare something. At least mm -hmm. all the stuff commands, I, I, I try to figure out what should be included in which re release and also the, the status, the maturity. Oh, wow. So this I'm, is I'm trying to, to, to do uh, it and, awesome. uh, and, and use it as a proposal for us to, to discuss it. This is great. Uh, I'm doing. This is awesome. Okay. This is great. Yeah, this is awesome. This is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think once it is done, I can send out this uh, Markdown file to you for a review. Yeah. Great. You should. This is awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess we have gone over, I think the last, uh, the remaining thing was, I still see some items currently marked for RC when we don't have an assigned owner. So maybe let's take a look at any items in RC1 um, project to see if yeah, we can- Yeah, uh, sorry, 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 Sammy. Uh, there's one item we missed, uh, we, we didn't discuss it. This one, this one is uh, re-enable timestamping. Actually, there are four items identified by Pritesh and the million. And if we want to uh, uh, complete uh, these four items uh, in as one scope, it, it's a huge effort. Uh, I, I thought this okay. was, this will, this is not a must for RC1, right? So uh, uh, currently, let me open it. It is marked in the RC1 scope. Okay. But the four items, the cost is is very huge, especially the number three and then number four. It, it's like a different uh, library similar to Go Cozy, and mm -hmm. it will take a long time for review. I suggest we discuss it again with British and Milan on Thursday, or just Slack him. I think we didn't get a full answer from them. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll yeah. them this one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is the big, uh, big item in, in among all the uh, issues. Yeah, I, I just want, want to highlight the, the cost. <laughs> the issue with timestamps is that they're not a natural extension into COSI or JWT. 
we'd have to say, hey, we're using CMS or we have to use the new epoch time RFC and we haven't decided that. So that's part of the reason that this is so problematic. Yeah, basically, uh, if we want to support something, then we that means we need to implement uh, some library like Go CMS. Uh, so uh, because we want uh, the best quality, that means the uh, the Go CMS uh, sub library will have the same quality as the Go uh, Cozy. So uh, it may take time uh, to review it properly and implement it properly. Okay, so let's wait for a conversation with Moland and uh, Steve. Uh, by the way, uh, are we planning to uh, have a separate repo for the Go CMS library? Or we just implement in the notation code? Go? I think that's, I think we ultimately don't want CMS in Cozy. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, okay. Uh, yes, I know that. The, so the I CMS, think we would we would uh, potentially do it as a separate uh, library. Pardon? I would I would suspect we would do it as a separate library. Uh, uh, outside of the not call go, right? Yeah, I agree. That's what I was thinking. Um, uh, David E. Uh, Vanero, do you have any uh, comments on that? I mean, having a separate repo uh, for the uh, Go CMS. Makes sense based on what we discussed here, but I would also take, uh, uh, I would also see if what Milan uh, wants to do. Yes, uh, basically we probably need two, um, two libraries. One is the Go, Go, uh, Go CMS, just for CMS. Another is for the timestamping, uh, I would like to, Say it's a Go timestamp library, and mm -hmm. yes. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Roy, do you know uh, what's the latest status for the uh, for the Siebel based uh, uh, timestamping support? Well, we hadn't decided to support CMS, so I haven't even done the research yet. Oh, I see. Uh, because I have heard something like, yes, the, the current timestamp is in uh, ASN.1, uh, that's in CMS. Uh, I heard that we will have something like the uh, similar stuff in Sable and Cozy. Well, that's why Hank proposed a new format so, uh, with Carson Bowman to, to get rid of the CMS requirement or the ASN1 requirement. Hmm. So we are still pending. Well, we just didn't prioritize it. So we have to go figure out what we need to do here and what the acceleration is for what we're talking about with Skip. You don't need a timestamp because you're using the notary as your your proof of, of receipt. So we kind of need to have that discussion too. We were trying to get rid of baking in timestamps as a special backdoor. Yeah. Uh, that's also sound reasonable. The bigger problem here is timestamp confusion, right? If you have a secure timestamp and then there's a header that says I'm the time, which one is trumps who and being those right has always been a, a pain. We're way over here, so let's reschedule for Thursday and I'll have to do some research here, Shiwei. Yeah, yeah, thanks, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, time is up. Yeah, we can close this meeting and uh, yeah. Alright, good one. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye.